Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I, I'm, I went to uh, Dartmouth just up the road, so uh, being in New Hampshire in the winter always makes me feel like I'm at home. Uh, and walking through this beautiful building and looking at the photographs um, and just the history of New Hampshire politics reminds me of one of the great things about being a student in New Hampshire. Uh, you're uh, inevitably going to have a New Hampshire primary that you get to participate in or watch, whatever, however you want to do it. I remember attending in 1988 uh, the uh, debate, the Republican debate at the Hopkins Center at Dartmouth between then Vice President Bush and Pete DuPont and Al Haig and Pat Robertson and Bob Dole and Jack Kemp. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun and I know the students here probably have similar experiences uh, and because college is four years and presidential cycles are four years, you inevitably get at least one of them, maybe two if you're a bad student. Um, <laughs> and uh, so um, it's it just, it all feels like coming home to me, so I really appreciate that. I'm not normally uh, somebody who has a history writing about wars. Uh, I have covered wars from, generally from Washington, D.C. Uh, I have covered the policy of, of wars. I have covered the buildup to the war in Iraq, and I have covered up, uh, covered um, those advocating for use of force. I remember interviewing um, then Senator Bob Dole um, pushing uh, for intervention in Kosovo. Um, <clears throat> but I'm generally not somebody who is, who is focused on that part of our public policy. I did do a couple weeks in the ABC News Baghdad Bureau, um, but that was right after um, our then anchor of World News, Bob Woodruff, was uh, very seriously wounded by an IED. Uh, and it was a it was a terrifying <laughs> assignment, um, but uh, that was that was pretty much it for me uh, until um, October 2009. Now I had covered um, the debate as a senior White House correspondent for ABC News. I had covered the debate over the war in Afghanistan um, and as a national correspondent um, for ABC for. Um, Salon.com had covered Iraq uh, and Afghanistan as well. But it wasn't until this one very um, poignant moment in my life that I um, became more of a war correspondent than I ever thought I would ever be. The moment came um, shortly after the birth of my son, Jack. Jack was born October 2nd, 2009, he's now three, and the scratch uh, right here is from Jack, if you're wondering. Um, uh, and and uh, I was in the recovery room with my wife, uh, Jennifer, and our daughter, Alice, and Jack, holding Jack, uh, when uh, I caught this news report out of the corner of my eye um, about this attack on a base in Afghanistan. Now, as a news junkie and as a reporter, it's not really all that strange for me to be um, trying to like pick up what's going on in the news at any given time. I can tell you the date when uh, a certain Western Republican senator, um, when it came out that he was tapping his toe in a restroom in the Minnesota, Minneapolis um, men's room, because that happens to be the date that my daughter was born on October 27, August 27th, 2007. Less auspicious than, than this uh, television uh, viewing would be when on October 3rd, out of the corner of my eye, I caught this report about uh, combat outpost Keating, a, an outpost I'd never heard of uh, in a part of the world I'd never heard of. Um, and that morning, um, 53 U.S. troops woke up and they were being attacked by up to 400 Taliban. The camp was put in an almost impossibly vulnerable position. Um, as Clint Romache, a former staff sergeant who a week ago today was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Obama. As he put it to me in an interview, he is featured in the book, um, if you look up in the Army Manual what a defensible position looks like, this is the exact opposite of that. Um, it was uh, at the bottom of three steep mountains, 14 miles from the Pakistan border. And um, we in this country, some of us think of Taliban fighters maybe as primitive and backward and, and from a different century, um, but whatever you think of their ideology, they are good fighters. They are 
much tougher than the insurgents a lot of these troops faced a lot of these troops faced in Iraq, uh, and they are fierce and they are strategic. And there was something about this moment, although I did not realize it at the time, uh, as these things happen, as these things go, when you have a life-changing moment, you don't often realize it at the moment itself. But there was something about that moment holding my son, my newborn son, Jack, and hearing about eight other sons, eight uh, US troops taken uh, from this planet uh, on that day. And there was something about it that became a very moving experience for me uh, that I did not even realize at the time. And I wanted to know who these eight men were. I wanted to know who the other men were who served there, who survived, what it was like to face such a terrifying um, experience, to survive it, to beat back the Taliban. I wanted to know why anybody would put an outpost there. Um, and I waited as a news consumer for that information to come across my plate so I could consume it, and it never did. And this is in many ways why I became a journalist, why a lot of people become journalists. So I set out on my own to find out. And I started a few months later um, after the Army put out their report, what's called a 15-6, an investigation, anytime anybody dies, uh, that you have to do a 15-6, an investigation into what happened, what went wrong, sometimes not even for, for somebody's death. And um, the 15-6 didn't really answer the questions. The 15-6 uh, described what happened, reprimanded four officers, and basically moved on. And I, I didn't really get answers to my questions. So I made a phone call. I started uh, making phone calls. I started surfing the web. I started trying to find people who were there. Uh, and eventually I got through to the mom of one of the soldiers and then she put me in touch with her son and he put me in touch with his first sergeant and it went on from there. And pretty soon I had a book proposal. Um, I had not written a book in a decade. I had the last book I wrote was about the, the recount, the Florida recount, which is much more familiar territory for a political reporter like me. Um, but uh, the publisher uh, was very supportive and they, and they, they bought it. Um, and I started to work on it, and uh, I heard at that point from somebody who had helped set up the camp in 2006, an intelligence officer named Ross Burkoff, who was with 371 CAV. The men who had been attacked uh, in, in 2009 were 361 CAV from Colorado. These were, this was 371 CAV out of uh, New York. And Ross wanted me <clears throat> to tell the stories of troops who had helped set up the camp. I couldn't just tell the story of the end of the camp, he said. I needed to explain why they were there, why they had been put there, and perhaps most important to Ross, I needed to tell the stories of men who died in the service of this outpost, uh, whether forming it or, or working there, um, because their stories needed to be told too and were not being told. Um, and then I heard from a First Lieutenant Dave Roller, um, who was a lieutenant with the next squadron that served there, um, 191 CAV, uh, out, of, um, out of Germany. And um, he wanted me to tell the stories of the troops that had served with him. And his commander, Captain Tom Bostick, who didn't make it home, and Staff Sergeant Ryan Fritchie, and uh, Private First Class Chris Pfeiffer, and he wanted me to tell the stories, and, and his Commander Lieutenant Colonel Chris Kalinda wanted me to tell the stories of the successes that they had in Afghanistan. He wanted there to be a, a broader context. And ultimately, these troops um, convinced me to write a much longer book, a much, a much a more comprehensive book that is the history of one outpost. And in looking at the history of this one outpost, hopefully, people like me, people who do not have a direct uh, connection to the military and do not know people on a regular basis in their day-to-day -day lives who are serving over there, who are part of the, in other words, 98, 99% of the country, who really has no connection whatsoever to the wars being waged in our name. Uh, I could better understand these lives, not just of um, the troops, but of, of their moms and their dads and their children, of their spouses, 
we have a, a spouse right here, uh, Carrie Stickney. She's with uh, her husband, Keith Stickney. If anybody's read the book, he's the very brave mortarman who's up at Observation Post, Fritchie, a uh, very brave man. Uh, and Carrie's here, and I'm honored by your presence here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, One of, the th one of the things that, that in addition to not paying enough attention to our troops, me, I'm, I'll speak only for myself, in, in addition to people like me in the media not paying enough attention to our troops, we pay nowhere near enough attention to their families back home who are dealing with so much um, and uh, are not, it's not a lucrative position. It's not, these are, these are not uh, well-paying jobs. These are not easy lives, but they are lives um, lived uh, for us so that we might have better lives and more secure lives for our children. So in writing the book and understanding the lives that these people lead for us and who they were, the men and women who did not make it home, uh, and who they are, the people who did make it home, but are still struggling and still dealing with the war in their own way, even long after the war in Afghanistan is in the rearview mirror of the United States, and sad to say it's in the rearview mirror of too many of us already, including many of us in the media, um, this war will not ever end for some people uh, because of lives lost or limbs lost or the wounds we cannot see, uh, the ones that I hear in the catch in the voices of soldiers with, that I speak with on occasion or ones who came to Washington, D.C. last weekend or two weekends ago uh, for the Medal of Honor ceremony for Staff Sergeant Clint Romache. Uh, one, of the, one of the many, many brave soldiers who served there that day. Um, there, there, is a, there is a public health crisis uh, in no small way uh, in this country that we're not, as a, as a nation, we're not, we have not done enough to make sure that these troops and their families know that there is care and there is support and, and that they, there is no shame in seeking it. Um, so writing the book then became this, this project that I became intensely involved in in a way that I never, ever have been involved in anything, uh, any professional project. I always have to say professional because I, of course, am married and have two children, so there, there's big projects there too. But, but in terms of a professional project, I've never been, I've never faced anything like that. I was able to do it because um, of my wife understanding that this was not just a book that I wrote because I got a contract and it was, it'd be cool to write a book, that this became something else that I wanted to do, something that I needed to understand about the people who were fighting for us and trying to understand the war in Afghanistan writ large by looking at one small corner of it, trying to understand why it's so tough, why is it so difficult, trying to get beyond the numbers that I had bandied about in my coverage for ABC News from the North Lawn of the White House, that there's a debate between McChrystal and Obama about how many troops should be sent there. Will it be 10,000 or 20,000 or 40,000? Numbers that in retrospect seem rather cold, like I'm rattling off baseball scores, when understanding who these eight men were meant a lot more to me than, than saying a number like 40,000. And by coming to understand just a bit what these people go through and, and what they are asked to do, in the context of the policies uh, that they are asked to carry out by the generals and the presidents who send them there. Um, I came to understand the war in Afghanistan much, much better. I came to understand um, the troops who serve uh, much, much better and their families. Um, and my hope is that others will read the book and find it similarly informative, not just on an intellectual level, this is what counterinsurgency means, counterinsurgency being the strategy that the military had to try to um, encourage Afghans and Iraqis uh, to not um, align with insurgents by convincing them that there was a better way, connecting them to their government, um, giving them money for development projects, um, having showing them that casting the insurgents out of their villages was, was the, the superior move and the smarter move for them. Explaining it in that, con explaining it um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broad policy context, I knew what it was, but it wasn't until I really drilled down and saw how difficult it is 
for not just the Americans to, to convince the Afghans uh, to bond with them, but for the Afghans who are uh, torn between insurgents who come and kill them if they cooperate, um, insurgents who are in some cases members of their own family, um, and, and how difficult that, that process is. And through writing this book, I've come to a much greater understanding of what our, you know, of this longest war that we faced and um, that are, we are still facing. And I hope, my hope is that readers will understand it, not just intellectually, but also emotionally. Also coming to understand um, both the inspiration and the bravery and the courage, but also of course the tragedy and the loss um, that, that we, we see uh, in the newspapers and on uh, Memorial Day, but generally most of us do not understand it um, in anything other than an academic sense. So um, if it became this project that, that, um, that became uh, just a mission that I had to complete and my wife was unbelievably understanding about letting me work on work nights and weekends and on holidays and on vacations. Um, and I don't know if she'd ever let me do it again, though, I'll say that, because uh, it, it was a two and a half year project. And like I said, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Um, and it was, uh, and, and ABC News was, was supportive. Um, I went to Afghanistan twice, once with President Obama as he did a, a Thanksgiving trip there in 2010. And then also in 2011, I went with a great producer uh, named Ely Brown with Nightline, and we were embedded with a medevac unit at Bagram, and then I got as close as I could to Combat Outpost Keating, uh, although it does not exist anymore, Combat Outpost Keating. Um, and I, I got there and I was embedded with a different group, uh, the 227 uh, Infantry Wolfhounds. Um, a lot of people wonder, you know, was it worth it? What do I think? People, I mean, people who, not a lot of people in general, but a lot of people who come to the book events um, wonder if, if I thought it was worth it. And the truth is I can't say whether or not it was worth it. Obviously, progress has been made, and there is a much better functioning government in Afghanistan now than there was in, in 2001 when the war began. Um, it's not for me to judge uh, whether uh, it was worth it, and it was not, it's not for me to judge whether the policies were the right one, w right ones. And they've shifted. You know now our policy is train the Afghans and get out. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much where we are. Although I do think after 2014, we, they haven't announced it yet, but there'll be, I would guess, somewhere between three and, and 7,000, that's just a rough guess, three and 7,000 special forces troops and support troops to, that will stay in Afghanistan for some time. Um, the book uh, was not written as an anti-war book and it was not written as a pro-war book. Um, I've had people read it both ways, which is fine because I did not try to take a position on the war itself. I tried to just, just to tell the story of these troops. There are a couple, there, there are two small, small arg um, arguments I make in the book at the end, at the very end of the book, but other than that, the, the conclusions are for you to make, and one of them is, if we are going to send our troops into harm's way, then we need to make sure they have everything they need to do the job, period. And uh, throughout the entire lifespan of Combat Outpost Keating from 2006 until its demise, they do not have everything they need to do the job. Most, uh, especially, they don't have helicopters. They don't have enough helicopters. Um, that's something I didn't fully understand when I started writing the book, but in retrospect, one of the reasons why the outpost was put, where it was put is because in order to resupply the camp, they didn't have enough helicopters to do it by air, so they had to put it near the road. You know, in that part of Afghanistan, you're, it's the, at the foot, the foot of the uh, Hindu Kush mountain range, you're either on a mountain or at the bottom of a mountain. So if you need to be near a road, you're not going to be on a mountain. You're not going to have the high ground. You're going to be, at the, you're going to be uh, vulnerable on the low ground. That's a decision that was made because we did not have a hel enough helicopters in Afghanistan at that point. And in fact, in 2007, there were 20 times the number of troops in Iraq as there were in Afghanistan, 20 times. So that's one conclusion I reach. And the other one uh, is more subjective, and uh, even people who, who like the book in general disagree with me on this point, but is um, what I view as the inertia of Army thinking, which is 
um, it's it they it, to to acknowledge a mistake and to and to leave is a difficult thing for the army to do. And it seems to me there were any number of times during the the life of this outpost when uh, it made sense to shut it down um, because it was just too vulnerable and it wasn't necessarily accomplishing anything. Um, but the decision was not made to do so because that's not what the Army does. And it's part of what we love about the Army, that they, they say that they can do anything we send them to do, and they'll do it, and they'll make it happen, and they'll make it work. And that's, that's one of the things that's great about this country and great about our Army. But it also, as just as every asset has a liability, it also comes with the flip side, which is there is a tendency to not acknowledge, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. Let's take that. Let's remove that camp. Let's close that camp. So in any case, uh, I don't know how many people here have read the book. Um, I hope you all will read it, uh, and, uh, and, but, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, you might have. Uh, and I don't know how we're doing this. Is there, is there a microphone? We're going to have a microphone at the back there, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And it does not just have to be about the book. I'm your captive, so you can ask about anything you want. Yes, sir. And please tell me who you are and where you're from. Thanks for coming. A great illuminating night. So in, in researching the book and in, even in the, the, in the nascent idea that you had, it sounds like you understood you, that you didn't have a military background. Right. I do not. T tying in New Hampshire and the, spe the special aspect of New Hampshire in the first primary and choosing presidents. Can a president do what a president has to do without a military background? It's a great question. Um, yes, and you know we have civilian control of our military, and that's in the Constitution, and, and that's that's uh, it's there for a reason. I did not understand everything about. The, I, first of all, those guys speak a whole different language. I mean, the, their acronyms are crazy, mm -hmm. and every year they have a whole new round of acronyms that you have to learn. Um, but yeah, no, I learned a lot about the military culture and the military language and what an NCO is and, you know, the difference between a staff sergeant, a first sergeant, a sergeant first class, and a sergeant. And, um, and uh, one of the greatest compliments I got a week ago was from this um, master sergeant who was not hugely cooperative with my book. Uh, but he, uh, he, he, I threw a party for Romache and the guys, a reunion, um, two Saturday nights ago, and he came. And he, he, he asked me when I served. And I was I, I never served. And that was like the greatest compliment I've ever gotten in my life, that this, this guy, a very skeptical guy, read the book and was convinced just because I understood everything that I, that I had served. I will say I had a lot of people who served read it and make corrections. Uh, so the, their proofreading skills are really what was being complimented. But um, to get to your question, uh, I don't think you need to um, have served to be a president or even to be a secretary of defense. I will say that uh, it's good to have some people who have served to be there making decisions when you are sending troops into harm's way. And for this reason, um, Without taking a position on Sergeant and former Senator Chuck Hagel, uh, who I understand has some views that not everyone agrees with, and I'm certainly not taking a position on him per se, but the idea of somebody who served, especially somebody who was an enlisted man, enlisted man uh, has appeal to me. Because I do think that people who have served and know what it is to serve should have a say. That doesn't mean they should have the final say, but they should have a say. So I guess my answer is no, but, but whoever's president should have an understanding, and they need to have people who have served around them. Um, and by the way, uh, when you, especially when you look at, um, I mean, this current Secretary of State, John Kerry, and possibly Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, who have five Purple Hearts between them, and um, Hagel still has shrapnel in his chest, having served does not necessarily, as I think those two men uh, exemplify does not necessarily make you more likely to go to war. In some cases, it might make you less. Correct. Um, so, I mean, there's a real, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a viewpoint one way or the other. There are people in the military, I'm sorry, in Congress right now, 
<clears throat> Congressman Tom Cotton, for example, from Arkansas, he's, uh, I would say he's definitely more, he's very conservative and he's more rightward when it comes to military intervention, I believe. Um, and others, such as uh, Hegel Kerry, uh, I would say, even though they both voted for Iraq and Afghanistan, w those wars, um, they seem more skeptical of, of the use of force. Thank you. If that answers your question. Thanks. Sure. Concord's a beautiful town. Yes, sir. My name is Jared Kenny from Manchester, New Hampshire, and I had two questions. Why did you dedicate the book to your mom, and are you going to talk about your new show? Sure. Um, I dedicated my book to my mom because I love my mom. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, it was her turn. I'd, I'd, I dedicated my first book to my brother and my second book to my father. And so it was, my wife will be my fourth book. Um, but also, I think in all, in all honesty, there, I'm glad it worked out the way it did because um, the book, uh, the moms of the eight soldiers who didn't make it back, uh, some of them have really become a big part of my life. Uh, and. Uh, will continue to be so until Facebook um, collapses. Uh, and uh, I think the moms are, are, their support of the book um, meant a lot to me. And so um, dedicating it to my mom, who uh, was born in Canada, and I never really understood what she was talking about when I was a kid. And she always said, well, if there's ever a draft, we're going to go back to Canada. Uh, uh, and I was, you know, six, and I had no idea what she was talking about. But now I have a better understanding of what she was talking about. In uh, my new show, uh, I, I, I recently left ABC News um, because CNN offered me, made an offer I could not refuse uh, to become their chief Washington correspondent and also have my own show. Uh, it will be called The Lead. It will be, uh, it will offer a wide variety of news items. It will start at four o'clock um, next month. Uh, Monday through Friday. It'll start at 4 o'clock and then maybe maybe move later in the day once it's up and running. Um, and the goal is just to like have, a, if, you, if you picture like, when you know those moments when you have like the, a front page of a newspaper, whatever newspaper, and there are like seven stories and you want to read them all. And it's like there's a great politics story, a great business story, a great health story, pop culture, sports, and international relations. You want to read them all. That's the goal of my show, is to offer a different section and a good, smart treatment of each one of those topics, of what we think is the lead or the most interesting story in each one of those topics every day. And, um, you know, through interviews and roundtables and just smart coverage, uh, the kind that I think, uh, I think we'd all agree there could be more of on television. So that's the goal, and I hope you watch. Thank you. Thanks. Hi yes, there. sir. I'm Zach Gregorick. I'm a junior politics major here at St. Ace. Um, my question for you would and be... And apparently an EMT. Yes. Um, my, my question for I'm you is reporter. actually health-related. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Don't, don't drop. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my, my question for you is actually health-related. Um, in terms of... Uh, I'm sure you've, you saw a lot of, you know, sort of mental health uh, problems as a result of, Absolutely. of fighting. Absolutely. Um, what would be, do you think, is the biggest, you know, just if you could improve one thing just by snapping your fingers, what would it be for that area, as, for veterans specifically? Uh, it, without question, it would be the trauma. It would, I, it, would, it would be forcing every soldier, I mean, it, it's a snap of the finger, so this is going to be like really yeah. pie in the sky. Yeah. Forcing every soldier who has served in combat or near combat um, to realize there's no shame in seeking help. Uh, making all of the people, all the counselors available to them, excellent and qualified. And I mean no disrespect. My mom was a psychiatric nurse at the Veterans Administration in Philadelphia, so I have nothing but respect for another class of people who are underpaid and overworked. Mm. But I think we can acknowledge that there's always room for improvement, and the VA is no exception. Um, that, that's what it would be. Uh, I don't know one soldier who served at Combat Outpost Keating uh, and was there for the attack that day, who doesn't have something. Uh, and some of them deal with it, and some of them avoid it. And I've talked to a bunch of them about it, and why have they avoided it? Because it's too painful. It's too painful for them to deal with. And you can speak logically with them about this, um, but there's no logic to it. There is a mess of ugliness and hate and terror, and eight of their friends were killed. 
and they just don't want to go anywhere near that in their brain and in their heart. And so they walk away from it or they self-medicate with bourbon or they seek thrills on motorcycles or whatever it is they do, but you can't escape it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And some of them have been dealing with it and some of them have not. And you know, there are, this is, this is part of the book, there's a whole um, pub, so I, I recommend this book for you, but, uh, but, but there's, a, there's a part of it at the end of the book about uh, one of the soldiers who served there and survived that day had such horrible PTSD that he sought comfort in some rather uh, tough drugs and died. He overdosed less than a year after the attack. Um, and there are, there was an, there's another soldier who was very honest with me, very up, up front, and told me about the PTSD he was experiencing. It's in the book. There are um, more than two million Americans served in Iraq or Afghanistan, two million. The RAND Corporation says that maybe 20% of them have some form of problem, whether it's post-traumatic stress disorder or something. There was a great article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal Saturday uh, about a guy, an Iraq veteran, a Marine, um, who's dealing with something that is, I guess, is now being called moral injury. I guess it can be survivor's guilt. Um, feelings of ambivalence or, or troubling uh, feelings about things that one did while in a combat zone. There are a lot of, there are a lot of problems out there, and, and, and if I could do anything, I would snap my fingers and re have these people, have these brave, brave troops realize there is nothing that they can't tackle, even the stuff that's in them, even in their hearts and in their heads, and I would have the government and the medical community be up to that task. You know, two million, 20% of 2 million, and I think Rand is being rather stingy on that number, 20% of 2 million is 400,000 people, 400,000. And I think it's much higher than that. You figure, I think they estimated 40% of them were in treatment. And by the way, the guy who overdosed, he was in treatment. So, you know, it's a big public health challenge we're going to have. And uh, I, hope, I hope our country's up for it. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Ben Bolger from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I went to Dartmouth like yourself. And I was wondering. What class? Uh, I, I did a, a master's degree in oh, okay. 2004. Nice. Um, and what I was wondering is if you could reflect on uh, journalism is one of those professions that you don't necessarily have to have a professional degree right. in order to practice. And so there's a variety of ways that people become journalists. Yes. And I was wondering if you could reflect on the path that may have began during college or later. What were the the key tipping points that made you really see it as a calling or something that made you very passionate to want to become a journalist? It's funny, you know, I, I, um, my path was, was circuitous. I mean, I can look back and realize that I, I did the, a newsletter when I was like eight in, my, in, like in the courtyard where I grew up and I, you know, I was editor of my high school paper and stuff like that, but I don't think I really thought about journalism as a career until my 20s. Um, even I tried other, I went to film school. I, I wanted to be a cartoonist. That's what I did at, at, at Dartmouth. I was active in this student newspaper because I did a daily comic strip. Um, and I kind of just, I ended up going into journalism for the same reason that I ended up writing this book is that there were things that I thought would be cool stories and nobody was writing them. And one day I was on a ski weekend with some friends up in Killington and Somebody there, he and his brother had written a story in the New Republic, and it was in a, it was like wow, you, actual people, just like people, can write things and get them published, and like maybe I should try that, and I started writing freelance stories. I mean, it's it's silly stuff. I mean, it was um, an article for the Dartmouth Alumni Magazine about Andy Shu, Andrew Shu, who at the time, you. Young people here are like, who? Andrew Melrose Place was a TV show back in the, my day. <laughs> uh, Andy Shue was a couple years ahead of me at Dartmouth, and he was, Melrose Place was the hottest show on television, and Andy Shue was like the hottest guy. And so I wrote a story for the alumni magazine about that um, called Shoe Happens. And uh, he was not a fan of the title, uh, I was later told. Uh, and just other, just other things, a lot of uh, entertainment stuff, to be honest. Um, and then... I started getting assignments from Washington City Paper, and then the editor of Washington City Paper, who's now a columnist for the New York Times, David Carr, 
uh, took me out to lunch and convinced me to take a huge pay cut and become a journalist. And that's how it happened. And then I just worked my way up the, you know, worked my way, city paper, salon, and then ABC and now my own show on CNN. That's how it happened. But I don't, you know, p uh, fil um, journalism school works for some people. I, you know, I think of it the way I, I think of film school, which is if you want to do it, that's great. You don't need to do it. If you really want to do it, just go do it. Start at the bottom and work your way up. But um, I'm glad I ended up doing it. I mean, I, I, I don't know what took me so long, but it's a lesson for all the young people in here. You don't have to know what you're doing for the rest of your life when you graduate. You don't. You might not figure it out for a decade, whatever your parents say. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you don't have to get a job. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Rosemarie Rung from Merrimack, New Hampshire. And uh, congratulations on your move to CNN Thank you. and uh, your book, and best wishes for your new show. Uh, my question is, since this um, story came to you on an important day of your life and all the work and research you did for it, has that changed you as a journalism or how you, as a journalist or how you approach your profession? I think so. It's definitely, I think it's definitely changed me as a, as a journalist and I think it's definitely changed me as a person. I think both are true. I hope, I know it's made me a better person to know what bravery and courage really is and to know what should be celebrated in this country. It's made me a much more humble person and rightly so. Uh, to know people like Clint Romache or Keith Stickney or others and what they do. I came back from drinking one time with Dave Roller and Alex Newsom who are in the book and I just I said to my wife, I am such a piece of garbage. Like these guys, Dave Roller and Alex Newsom, who are lieutenants in the second part of the book, are, Roller is from Coral Gables and Newsom is from Beverly Hills. They are elite, wealthy, could do anything guys, and they went into the army. Um, now, yes, they went in as officers, so it wasn't that tough. That's just a joke. Um, uh, no, they went, but I mean, what they did, their dedication, uh, and I, it just, it just really, it really, it was, uh, I'm just very, I'm, to know these people is to be humbled by them, and to know that that's really, that is selflessness. So I think that, that shades everything about my life now, um, in terms of my journalism, in terms, and hopefully in terms of a sense of what truly should be respected, um, and I don't only mean that the military should be respected, because certainly there are people who exemplify selflessness in all walks of life, whether it's medicine or uh, charity or education or whatever. But, but this was how I really came to understand it. Um, and in terms of journalism, I just think it's, I think it's, um, I think that military action in Washington, D.C. is debated as if we're talking about a football game. And these are people's lives. And they'll do what you tell them to do. And maybe the cause is worth it. And maybe Americans have to die for something to be achieved. But it's not a game. And, and you know, to hear people debate it one way or the other, uh, I just find it flip. And it, I find it distasteful. And I regret to say that I probably was part of that in, in during parts of my life, my parts of my professional life. Um, and I hope that I don't make that mistake ever again. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Drew Klein, also a reporter. Hi, Drew. <laughs> hey, Drew. I know Drew. <laughs> um, I, then you might. <coughs> Drew's with the <coughs> New, Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire union leader. But I'm here on my <coughs> own private time. Um, He's just somebody who should be recognized, is all I'm saying. Oh, yeah, right, no, no. As, as you were saying, the, the military <coughs> folks in this room are the ones to, yeah. to recognize. Um, I'm curious, you, you started your talk about uh, wanting to get into the book because of this sort of gap in the media coverage. Yeah. You were waiting as a consumer, and, and it never came. And yeah. you talked about reaching a conclusion, uh, a couple of conclusions at the end of the book, but they were policy-related. And what I'm curious about is, 
as you were going through this book, you know, what conclusions did you reach about how this war has been covered by the press and what sort of slap your head moments did you have, maybe, if you had them, um, to reach those conclusions? It's a great question, because you're right, I completely avoided it in the book. I, I mentioned <laughs> it at the front of the book a little bit about how we don't cover the wars enough, but for the most part, um, uh, th well, we, that we don't cover the, the, the graphic nature of war enough. There's a, there's a warning at the beginning of the book that one of the um, snipers uh, who uh, helped me with the book, helped me write the book, said that I should, I should make sure to, to write so that people who have loved ones who were injured or were wounded or who died might not want to read parts of the book or maybe even the book at all. Just a warning that while it's not gratuitously violent, it does explain what war is. Uh, it does explain what an RPG does to a body uh, in a way that I did not know uh, when I started writing the book because it had never been explained to me and I'd never really heard about it because the media, especially the broadcast media, really shuns away from that kind of coverage. Um, and, and they're taking their cues from the American people. Um, in terms, uh, but, but other than that, I mainly let the soldiers speak about the media coverage. There are some amazing war correspondents um, and there are some great reporters who, who are in the book, who show up because they were at Combat Outpost Keating. Um, Nick Patton Walsh, who's now with CNN, but was at the time with Channel 4, um, and others. But it's, it's, it is, you cannot escape the conclusion that we in the media are part of the problem in the, dis the disconnect that the public feels for um, that the disconnect that the public has from our soldiers and their families, which exists, it is a chasm. And while I don't say uh, we should have a draft or we should have a tax or we should require national service, I don't see how it's sustainable. I just don't. And one of the reasons that there is this disconnect, to be completely frank, is because of the public, because the public doesn't buy the magazines that has the war on the cover, because the public changes the channel when a war story is on. And so this capitalist media system we have tries to find what people are interested in and tries to feed them that. Um, we don't, I, I mean, the general conclusion I have is we don't cover the wars enough, and one of the reasons is, I think, because everybody thinks the wars are only depressing stories, and the truth is there are very moving and inspiring stories. Um, and, uh, uh, all I can say is I will try to make sure that my show doesn't make the same mistake um, and that we do talk about the wars. Uh, one of the producers um, who I just hired said that CNN used to do a show called This Week in War, and it was later folded, it was later folded into a different show and then kind of just disappeared. I said, well, let's bring it back. We'll do it every, at least every week we'll cover. And that might not sound like a lot, but there'll be a lot more than a lot of shows do. Um, so... I think it's a problem, and you know that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And it's I'll I'll try to I'll try to rectify it a bit in my show. But you know you you have influence. What what do you find? Do you find that if if you don't mind my asking you a question, <laughs> do you find that I mean do people not want to read stories about soldiers? Or? Well, it, in New Hampshire they do. Yeah, I, I I can't say what it's like elsewhere, but here um, I mean we have a the Union Leader has a veterans page. We're yeah. one of the few papers that has a whole page devoted to veterans and coverage and. Um, I found that if you tell the story, um, as you do with your book, people are, are highly interested in it. And, and that is, that's it. what I think, too. I mean, I, I think that the public, especially now after 11 years of war, the public really wants to hear these stories. That they realize, we, I'm including myself, realize that we kind of haven't been paying attention as closely as we mm -hmm. should have been, and, and there's an appetite for it. Yeah, I, I, there's, there's clearly an appetite for it. Um, you know, in New Hampshire, there's a big appetite for it. I don't know about everywhere else in the country. But, um, you know, what you were talking about um, with the, you know, the way you were presenting the, the coverage and, and why it is the way it is sounds like a really good book topic to me. <laughs> well, um, I look forward to reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks for coming, Drew. Hi. Uh, my name is Matt Hurd. I'm a senior here at St. A's. Um, and I'm curious, as a journalist, what you think of, uh, with movies like Zero Dark Thirty uh, and such coming out these days, um, what you think of sort of that bridging that gap from 
excuse me, journalism into entertainment, particularly as for somebody like Mark Bowl, who is a journalist and now is the screenwriter for right. films like that. Um, is that something that's, is it helpful in raising public awareness? Is it, you know, is it dishonest in some way in that it attracts attention in the, in the wrong manner? Or is it something that's helpful? I haven't seen Zero Dark Thirty. I've read, a th you know, I, the movie's like two hours long, and I've definitely read more than two hours worth of articles about Zero Dark Thirty. Um, mm -hmm. So I can't really judge it. Uh, I en I loved the Hurt Locker, but I know a lot of troops didn't like it because they found its portrayal of a of, of a of a bomb of an ordnance disposal technician as kind of like an out of control rogue. They found it unrealistic, um, but I I loved it. Um, you know, I. I the public gets its information from a lot of different ways. And in, in, in some ways, you, it's almost like the question about, is it worth um, going on Colbert or The Daily Show to talk about these issues? You know, I think you have to go where the people are. Uh, if you only, like, you know, when, when we, did a, we did an hour-long show on CNN about Clint Romache. Um, I started at CNN on a Tuesday, and I was out in Minot, North Dakota, which, by the way, if you think you know what cold is, <laughs> you do not. Uh, I was out in Minot, North Dakota that Friday, interviewed Clint. He's a former staff sergeant, one that was awarded the Medal of Honor. He's in my book. Um, and afterwards, I, call, I didn't even know what it was going to be for. I figured we'd just like run a segment or two on Wolf's show and Anderson's show, whatever. And I, ca I called Jeff Zucker afterwards because Clint was so moving. He was so powerful. I, I think because he'd known me for two and a half years and I knew the story very well, he trusted me. He knew that I was very interested in getting the story right and that I would honor not just him, but the other troops who served there that day. And he was a great interview. It was one of the best interviews of my life because he trusted me. And I called Jeff Zucker, the new head of CNN, and I said, you have to, we have to give this an hour. And he said, okay, well, we'll see. Write a script. I wrote the script. He said, great, we'll do it. Um, taking that risk, by the way, which it didn't even occur to me because I've been so focused on this book and the Afghanistan war, for so long, it didn't even occur to me, but after it ran, and it did reasonably well, it did better than what usually runs at that time, which is a rerun of Anderson Cooper from two hours before, it, but it did better than that, um, I, I realized that it was a risk for CNN to do that. An hour about a war, you know, but people watched it, uh, to also touch on, on Drew's uh, point before. But when, my, my, the point, this long answer, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, when doing that documentary, they used video of the attack on the base from the Taliban, that was Taliban video, and they used video from inside the base from other attacks. And they say that in a, in a screen at the very, very beginning, so people, you know, some of the video here is from other attacks at Combat Outpost Keating. But they needed to do something to show the, the perspective of, of inside the camp and um, nobody was filming anything, you know, for the U.S. when it was attacked on October 3rd, 2009. My point is, that's what documentary makers do. They try to adhere as close to the truth as possible, but they, cheating's not the right word, but they have to, like, take some artistic license in order to illustrate the, the larger nonfiction that they're trying to make, the l larger nonfiction point they're trying to make, the larger nonfictional narrative. <clears throat> I think that fictional accounts can be just as important, um, and I see no shame in them, theoretically. Um, I don't know about the whole, the, the whole torture thing in Zero Dark Thirty. I, don't, I haven't seen the movie, and so I'm going to spare you my opinion on it, uh, because I have not seen it. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it, uh, theoretically. Thanks. Okay. I guess, uh, last question, so we'll, okay. Hi, I'm Dan Scanlon from Auburn. Thanks for uh, returning to New Hampshire. Uh, we, we're hearing a lot tonight about Clint Romashier, and I'm curious about what you've learned about how one qualifies for and gets selected for the Medal of Honor. It's interesting. It's a very arduous and bureaucratic process, the Medal of Honor. Clint was actually um, first put up for a l slightly lesser award, the Distinguished Service Cross. But as it made its way up the chain of command, somebody upgraded it to uh, the Medal of Honor. 
<clears throat> as, you, as you may or may not know, the Medal of Honor is awarded in very rare instances for when somebody performs an act of selflessness knowing that somebody else in that previous that had also tried had already been killed. So it is almost as if you have to know that you will be killed, not just in a theoretical way, but because somebody has actually been killed. Um, which is interesting because there were so many acts of bravery that day. Um, just one example, um, Sergeant, uh, I think Staff Sergeant uh, Josh Hart was a guy who, there were a bunch of guys, there were a bunch of soldiers that day who were trapped in a Humvee on the, uh, on the, in the outpost. And Sergeant Hart told his superiors, I'm going to get in this truck and we're going to drive over there and provide them with cover. And it was, you know, there was a 99% chance it was a suicide mission, that he wasn't going to make it back. And in fact, he did not. But that, I don't think that in itself, and I'm not an expert on this, but I don't think that in itself qualifies for a Medal of Honor because he was the first one to have tried it. It seems kind of peculiar on one level why the first person should not, be getting, not get the Medal of Honor, but the second person does. But in any case, um, Romache uh, went into places where people had been killed before him. Um, there's another uh, soldier, Ty Carter, um, who is up for the Medal of Honor also from the same, uh, from 361 Cav, uh, Black Knight Troop. Um, I've learned that it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful tradition, and it's kind of random and kind of subjective. They're very subjective. Um, and while people in the civilian world, like myself, don't truly understand how important these medals are to troops, they mean so much to these guys. It is incredible. I mean, I made an editorial decision you know, as a general rule to not list all the medals that people were awarded for different actions because I mean, it's already a 600-page book, and I you know, didn't want to make it an 800-page book. Um, but uh, they, they mean a great deal to these guys. What did Keith get? He got Silver Star, yeah. I think that's it. You've been a wonderful audience. I'm going to sign some books if anybody wants to get any. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you again very much for joining us. On behalf of our gratitude, we have a uh, nice New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Look at this. For you. This is like a silver star. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you.